Okay, well, happy Sabbath, everybody. Glad to be with you. I uh, hope that you are so far all enjoying this Sabbath day, day to rest from our labors. Today's title, uh, Sign, Sign, Everywhere a Sign. Uh, blocking up scenery, breaking my mind. Um, we're not speaking today about miraculous signs and wonders, as much as that would be very edifying. We're not speaking about the end times in our world today, as edifying as that might be as well. We're taking a different turn as, uh, today, um, if I can use that term. And I want to ask, God, have you ever noticed the abundance of traffic signs around us, right? Everywhere you look, there's traffic signs. Um, some signs regulate the flow of traffic, like the speed limit signs, stop signs. Others uh, inform us of what to expect ahead, such as construction signs, uh, speed bump signs, uh, curvy road ahead signs. And then there's uh, signs that indicate our location or provide directions, streets, uh, street names, mile markers, um, exit signs, and so forth. But it's very important that each traffic sign um, serves a purpose, and they do. Some provide us with useful information. Some keep us safe during our travels. Um, others direct us towards our destination. So without traffic signs, I think you could agree, driving would be chaotic, frustrating, frustrating and um, um, pretty dangerous. In this regard, uh, traffic signs are a great metaphor for the Bible because without proper signage from God, our lives would also be chaotic, frustrating, and dangerous. So through his inspired word and the spirit, God gave us signs that we need to provide us with useful information, safety guidelines, and directions for our ultimate destination. And that's why uh, the Bible is uh, referencing uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so the man of God may be complete, uh, equipped for every good work, right? So this is a, a simple presentation that attempts to present some spiritual road signs, if you will. And I want you to think about the utter chaos that would result from not paying attention to highway signs. And the sermon attempts to provide a spiritual application of uh, physical principles. Uh, I was driving along the road uh, shortly before the Feast of Tabernacles. I want to say it was 2004. And I was thinking about God and godly things, you know, as we are wont to do when we're alone and driving. And uh, I became acutely aware of the construction. Well, being from Illinois, everything's construction. So uh, I became aware of the construction and traffic road signs I was passing. And each sign, you know, while I was in prayer, seemed to speak to me a, a biblical principle as I drove to my final destination. And I was... I remember thinking what a, it was an amazing way to spend time with my creator. And I actually made uh, a message about it back in 2004 um, titled, entitled Road Signs, which uh, today's message is based on. Um, and as on the screen, as Nebuchadnezzar said in Daniel 4, um, I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God has wrought towards me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. When you see a traffic or construction sign, I encourage you to think of the biblical counterparts. Anytime we can spend thinking of God rather than the things of this world is um, time well spent. Okay. So we're all familiar with the red light or the stop sign. They both mean the same thing, stop. Stop our progress, sit motionless, wait. Got to admit, it may seem a little inconvenient at times, especially if you're on the road alone and you're sitting at a red light and no other traffic's there, but um, it also does keep us safe. It protects us from moving into a potentially dangerous situation. And the Spirit of God through the Bible often commands us also to stop moving ahead, think about what we're doing, right? It gives us an opportunity to think about what we're doing, consider its consequences, right? And some of the things that you know, popped out to me about stop signs were 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Awake to righteousness and stop, sin not. Stop sinning, right? For some have not the knowledge of God. And I speak this 
to your shame. For those who will promote, oh, you don't have to stop sinning, right? I'm not saying that you're going to be perfect, but command is don't sin, right? You don't use the safety net to jump into bungee jump into, right? And then John 5, 14, afterward, Jesus, finding him in the temple, said unto him, Behold, you're made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee, right? Um, not on your screen, um, for your notes, John 6, 43, you know, uh, don't murmur among yourselves. In other words, stop grumbling among yourselves. How many times do we do that? Um, John 7, 24. Um, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Stop judging incorrectly. Stop judging unbiblically, but do judge biblically, right? And uh, John 20, verse 27, uh, talking to doubting Thomas, stop doubting. Stop being who you are, what you're known for, Thomas. Stop doubting and believe, right? Don't be faithless. Believe. I want to talk about traffic lights. We're going to go on to the yellow light or, or the caution light. Uh, biblically speaking, caution is, hey, listen up, take heed, take heed. So Matt 24, uh, five, 4 and 5 says, And Jesus answered them and said, Take heed that no man deceive you. Be careful. Don't let anyone deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And uh, Mark 4, 24 and 25 he said to them, take heed what you hear, for what measure you meet, it will be measured to you. And unto you that, that hear shall more be given. For he that has, to him it shall be given, and he that has not, from him shall be taken even that which he has. Be careful, little ears, what you hear, right? Listen. I also uh, have, uh, in my notes, 1 Corinthians 8, 9. Take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours, and Ron mentioned the, our liberty in his prayer. Take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak. Be careful what you take, give allowance to, because we are our brother's keeper, and we have to think about how it may provoke folks around us, um, even though you may not be sinning by that, whatever that liberty is. Uh, and then on your screen, Luke 17.3. Take heed unto yourselves. If your brother trespassed against thee, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him, right? I mean, be cautious. Don't be overly bitter because you're going to put yourself into condemnation like they might have been for their trespass, right? And rather, forgive if they repent because you also have been forgiven with a great forgiveness. There's a lot of different things we can think about with the green light, Um so, and, and I tossed back and forth on which ones I was going to use, but um, green means go, right? And when we, God's word is clear, we're to do it, right? Loving others as ourselves, forgiving one another, sharing generously with those in need, right? Speaking truth and keeping our word. Those lights don't get any greener than that, right? When we sit through God's green lights, we lose opportunities to do the right thing towards our family, neighbors, friends, and even enemies, right? So it doesn't mean pause. When he says go, we go. Hebrews 11, 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out to a place where he should after receive for an heir, inheritance, he obeyed and he went out not even knowing whether he went. Sometimes we want to know every detail before we make a move and decision. And that's not always feasible. When God says to go, we go, right? Make sure it's his voice and then go. Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you shall go. I will guide you with mine eye. Because uh, someone's favorite, Psalm 119 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's a green light to my path. It tells you where to go, but it also tells you where not to go. And I will perform it and I will keep your righteous judgments. And I hope that we all feel that same way. We will keep them. Um, spiritually speaking, there's no park and ride, right? You know, park and somebody else. You're not going to get into the kingdom on someone else's coattails, so to speak, right? Um, James 4, 17. Therefore, to him that is knowing to do good and is doing it not, to him it's a sin, right? You can't coast through this, right? You need to be 
active and proactive with the word of God and the spirit. Because a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. And so your poverty comes on one that is travailing, like traveling, and one want as an armed man, right? Don't, don't think that we could ever, you know, take off the armor, right? But Satan's always there. He's always ready to attack, and we have to be ready for him. And that way, that spiritual armor is what's going to protect you and me, right? Philippians 3.12. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after that I may apprehend. I'm not going to park and ride and let somebody else, you know, do that, right? I'm going to chase after Christ, right? He apprehended me and I'm going to chase and apprehend him. And then 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Don't you know that all they which run in a race all run, but only one is receiving the prize? So run that you may obtain. It just felt like running. You, you need to be running the race. You can't stop. You can't. It's the tortoise and the hare. You may be running slow and sure like the turtle and not just sprinting like the hare and then getting distracted and going off the trail. You got to you got to run that race and run it with patience and trust in the Lord. I can't drive 55. Right. Every road. Um, almost every road has a posted speed limit, right? When we go over the speed limit, it, whether intentionally or accidentally, we can be stopped by the police and given a speeding ticket, right? The speed limit is posted for a reason, and it's enforced for the good of those who use the road. For example, in a residential neighborhood where there may be children and pets, you know, closer to the roads and that, it's going to be a slower speed in a parking lot, lots of traffic, lots of people. It's going to be a slower speed. In a similar way, God often places speed limits on his people. Often, what we might think is no apparent reason, God will command us to slow down. But God has a purpose in mind for the delay. And we might not be able to see that you know, beforehand. But be patient. Trust the plan of God when he asks you to slow down and wait. A couple of scriptures to back that up is Psalm 27, 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And then 2 Peter 3, 9, hey, the Lord isn't slack concerning his promise, but as some men count, as some men are counting slackness, but he is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Sometimes we must rush on that kingdom, rush on that kingdom. And that may be a selfish endeavor, and we may think it's not, but he's long suffering. He's waiting. He's hoping that more will come to repentance, or he's opened that door for more to come to repentance. I don't think he has to hope for it. That's his plan for us, and we may choose to do it or choose opposite. And that's, uh, life's all about choices, right? What about the U-turn sign? You see, more probably more than don't make a U-turn, authorized vehicles only. Um, but there's a U-turn, right? And when we see a U-turn, we think of our repentance, right? We think of that we're going one direction and we turn, right? All I know is I was one way and now I'm different, right? Matthew 3, 1 and 2, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying, repent you for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repentance is not preached in many churches today, um, but it is preached and it is truth. Uh, Matt 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Both the forerunner and uh, the Messiah preaching those same things, repent, right? And uh, his instructions to his disciples were the same. Mark 6, 12, they listened and they went out and preached that men should repent, right? Repent of your sin, repent of your wickedness. Um, and Peter uh, preached the same thing on that uh, you know, Pentecost day, Acts 2. Um, verse 38, Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Right? Wonderful promise it takes that repentance step first. Right Now, the goodness of God can draw you to that repentance, but you still have to make that move. You have to submit your will to his will. And Acts 319, repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. These are the things I thought of with the U-turn sign. But there's also, as I mentioned, the 
no U-turn sign. No, there's no U-turn allowed in service to God, right? No crying in baseball, no U-turn allowed in service to God. U-turns can be helpful if you're driving and suddenly you realize you're heading in the wrong direction. But sometimes we're tempted to get off the right road and return to things better left behind, right? Lots. Remember Lot's wife. Right? God's pleased when we follow him by faith and don't give in to our doubts, right? Once we've committed ourselves to God, there should be no turning back to our old ways Luke uh, 9, 62, Jesus said to him, no man having putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God, right? Remember Lot's wife. Hebrews 10, 38. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. And uh, 2 Peter 19 through 22, while they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, the same is he brought into bondage. For if after they've escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and the Savior, Jesus Christ, they're again tangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it had been better if they had not had known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Oh, Hebrews 10, 38 also. Um, if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So lots of times we see these road work ahead signs, right? And uh, I always think of the you know, preparation of the gospel. And uh, Isaiah 40, verse 3 through 5. Uh, we hear about the voice of him that is crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And uh, sometimes when you're going through that road work, you'll see this rough road sign right and sometimes our even though christ's yoke is a, a light yoke an easy low yoke then compared to what we're gonna we would end up with in the end uh if we went our own way um jesus even said in your this life you will have tribulation right so there's sometimes a rough road and some of you may be going through a rough road right now and i wanted to let you know that you know stay on course right he won't let you down. Um, not one, you know, will uh, of the, the his chosen will perish. Right? You can choose to do that, but if you're trying to make that way, you're going to make that way if you have faith and continue on. Acts fourteen twenty two confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. It's true. And, you know, that's one thing that doesn't really get preached a lot about is suffering with Christ or like Christ. Um, we may think of it in terms of like Christ suffering, um, maybe being put to death for your faith. But um, there's a lot of tribulation that goes on in our life that, um, you know, we have to be able to walk through giving God the glory in that. Um, and sometimes it's his chastisement. So we got to be careful with that. Always be in tune with the Lord and then you'll understand what his will for you is. Romans 8, 35 through 39 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Right. Um, also for your notes, um, I don't think I have it in here, but 2 Corinthians 4, um, 8 through 12, we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. 
always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. Sometimes uh, along that road, there's there's bumps in life, right? And sometimes you get a warning that there's a bump ahead. Isaiah 8, 13 through 15. Lots of scripture today, but I'm sure you'll enjoy that. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel and for a gin and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and snared and taken. Right? You see that bump? You don't slow down for it. You don't you know, understand its purpose. You've got to be careful. Proverbs 4 18 through 19, but the path of the just is as a shining light that is shining more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. Proverbs 24, 16 through 18, for a just man is falling seven times and is rising up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Rejoice not when your enemy is falling and let not your heart be glad when he is stumbling lest the Lord see it and it displeases him and he turn away his wrath from him and unto you, right? As the, uh, um, what's suggested there, unsaid. Be careful at what you take joy in when you see others fall or stumble. These things could have been us in times past or still could be. And remember who you serve and remember um, what, he has taught us and what um, his spirit brings us. Um, I think that those things, following that the word and that spirit will keep you lots of time from going the wrong way, right? Freeway on ramps, uh, one way streets have large signs that warn drivers that they're heading for danger if they keep driving in the wrong direction. Even if the road seems safe and the way is open, it could lead to a disastrous accident, right? God's word also warns us when we're about to go in the wrong direction. And he does it to keep us from harm or danger. And we're wise when we obey his warnings. And it keeps us off a sinful path because there's a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Right? Proverbs 14, 12. And Psalm 9, 119, 104. Through thy precept, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. I, I don't want to go the wrong way. I'm not going to enter it in those paths, right? Proverbs 4, 14. Enter not into the path of wicked and go not in the way of evil men. And then you have the thou shalt nots, right? That tell you the wrong way, right? I like to think of them as promises, but they also have that aspect to tell us what not to do. And I want to just read those 10 commandments into the record for us here. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, which has brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, and you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that's in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down yourself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of your Lord God in vain for the Lord will not hold him guilt guiltless that is taking his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger that's within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. And wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land in which your God is giving you. You shall not kill or do murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. 
You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Right? If, if you're looking at the, these signs are posted for our warning. Hey, don't be going that wrong way. There's danger there. There's potentially death there, right? Spiritually speaking as well. Sometimes the road gets closed. Sometimes it's open to some, allowed to pass through, like uh, where there's a, some, an incident, but you work at this place where you can get through or your neighborhood where you can enter in. Um, I picked uh, Isaiah 35, uh, 8 through 10 for that. A highway shall be there in a way it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. And uh, you know, let me read through 10, like I, I mentioned. This is just verse 8 on the screen. He says, No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. And they shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Right? That road will be closed. A detour time can be the difference between being late to a meeting or being on time. And it may mean that there's road construction or an accident or something on the road that we intended to take. And now we have to find an alternate route. I'm glad there's GPS because in recalculating it, you know, it'll find you another path. But um, the scriptures for us provide that through the spirit as well. Um, here in Acts 16, it's the spirit that shows that detour and i know you're familiar with this let's read, let's read it together starting from verse six now when they had gone throughout phrygia and the region of galatia and they were forbidden of the holy ghost to preach the word in asia after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go to bithynia but the spirit suffered them or allowed them not and they passing by Mysia, came down to troas and a vision appeared to paul in the night and there stood a Macedon man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go to Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called for us to preach the gospel unto them. Right? Sometimes that detour um, is meant for a purpose, a, a godly purpose. Other detours you have to be um, you know, cautious of, right? Um here, Matt 2, verses 12 through 15, uh, if you remember this, um, being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, this is the uh, wise men, they departed to their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord is appearing to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt. Take that detour. And you will and be there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. And there, he was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the Lord of the prophets, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. And God often puts a detour on our sign on our path. It, it may be because we're moving towards the wrong road. It may be that God has something different in mind for us. It may be... Uh, you know, a call he may be putting you through the fire for his glory uh for your tempering right um god's detour could be a change in career a change in schools a, a delay in the timing of something that you expected to take place the cancellation of something that you've been you know hoping for and desiring for for years but take courage because god knows what he's doing and his plans are always best for us in the final outcome proverbs 16.9, the man, mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps, right? We could plan our way, but we have to be um, able to submit to the Spirit and let him direct our steps. The narrow road. I see that. Of course, there's lots of things uh, you think of, but this is probably the primary scripture. Um Matt 7, verses 12 through 14. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, even so do to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Right? Enter you at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that is leading to destruction, 
and many there be which go there in their at, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which is leading unto life, and few there be that find it, right? And even those, you know, who may work miracles or do mighty things in the name of the Lord, they could one day hear, um, get away from me, I never knew you because of how they lived their life, because they didn't follow that narrow bridge. Um, not on a screen, but for your notes, First Peter 4, um, 1 through 4, I'll read that. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but rather to the will of God. For the times past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles or nations when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. That broad way many are taking, right? And we want to make sure that we stay on that narrow path, right? Similar to that is the one lane uh, road ahead. There's one, one lane, right? Jeremiah 32, 39 says, I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and for their children after them. And the, the Proverbs tells us that the highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He that is keeping his way is preserving his soul. Take that exit off the highway to hell and uh, you know, follow the Lord. You know, um, in construction areas, sometimes you'll uh, run across a sign warning, hey, don't pull off that road because there's a soft shoulder there, right? But when I saw the soft shoulder sign, it made me think of um, being able to comfort and, uh, and care for others, right? To have that soft shoulder. Um, Isaiah 66, 1, uh, 13. As one whom his mother is comforting, so will I comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. And Galatians 6, 2 tells us to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Have compassion on one another, right? Ephesians 4, 32. Be you also kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. See, many people, um, you know, in person or on social media that are very, um, very hard to people and they believe themselves justified in it. But it tells us to be kind and to be tender-hearted, to forgive, right, as we have been forgiven, and to trust God. In, for I mean, if you're opposing someone else, be careful that you're not opposing God or one of God's people, right? When we're driving, the uh, yield sign means we have to give priority to another person. Hey, this may bother you because you may feel that you're more important than anyone else. But God calls us to give priority to him, right? And to humble ourselves to serve others. Second Chronicles 30, verse 8. And be you not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord and enter into his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever. And serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. Also thought of Psalm 18. 43 and 44, you have delivered me from the strivings of the people, and you have made me the head of the heathen. A people whom I am not known shall serve me. As soon as they hear of me, they shall obey me. The strangers shall submit themselves unto me. Right? Prophecy, right? Uh, being that light to the Gentile and, uh, and calling them to himself. And James 4, 7 tells us to submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. So important. Um, I don't think I don't think there's enough effort striving against sin that you know Hebrews twelve four you've not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. Um, you know, resist that devil and uh, rather submit wholeheartedly unto God and each other. So uh, Ephesians four five twenty one says to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Right. Uh, also in his counsel, in his authority, and by his spirit. Um, also not in your notes, uh, Hebrews 13, 17, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority if they indeed are following after the Lord. 
One more yield sign here for us. Romans 6. Well, I almost want to read that whole thing, but uh, we're just going to read what's on the screen here. Likewise, reckon yourself also to dead indeed unto sin. Right? And, uh, it's very simply said, and we need to do that. And if you're not, is not getting less, uh, you know, against is not getting less, maybe trying with your own flesh and rather than with the spirit, submitting to the spirit of God. Consider yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield yourself members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but yield yourselves unto God, as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall you sin because we're not under the law? Don't even think of it. Don't let it be conceived in, in your mind, even. And uh, drop into verse 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness. And all that he represents. Uneven lanes. You know, I was going to think about um, the unequally yoked. So let me read that. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, a lot of people consider that just in the area of marriage, but that's doesn't. it's not talking about marriage in here, right? So it's talking about in the ways of life. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what concord part has he that have, is believing with that of an infidel or a non-believer? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them. Be you separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Amen. And uh, Second Corinth or First Corinthians ten twenty one tells us we can't drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. We can't partake of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Right. For your notes, jot in Leviticus 19, 35 through 37, talking about judgments, just weights and balances. Don't be uneven in those things. Uh, Deuteronomy 25, uh, 13 through 16, also talking about diverse weights in your bag. Again, measuring in, uh, uneven measures. Uh, and uh, Deuteronomy 22, uh, 9 through 11, um, don't sow your vineyard with diverse seeds, which speaks of the same principle, right? Don't plow with an ox and an ass together, uh, a diverse garment of wool and linen, those type of things together. Because again, he's teaching us the same principle to, you know, righteousness and unrighteousness do not mix, right? Uh, oil and water, except even worse, there's a great chasm between those two things. Dead end. Hmm. Hate when you run into one of those. Proverbs 7, 24 through 27 says, Hearken unto me now, therefore, O you children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart decline to her ways, nor go not astray in her paths. For she's cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. As Romans 6, 22 tells us, the wages of sin is death. Right, but also it encourages us that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, there's a, he's the only door, the only gate, the only way, the way, the truth, and the life. And we can help warn others about not entering into a dead end street, right? And that's you know to our benefit for His glory. James five, nineteen through twenty, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one converts you. Let him know that he that is converting the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death 
and hide a multitude of sins because they would have kept on sinning. And when you talk to them and they responded in the spirit and stopped doing those things, those sins don't happen, right? And uh, the body is much stronger for that. You know, I had uh, talked about the soft shoulder. and Sometimes we see the opposite, right? The hard shoulder. The shoulders, shoulders closed. And uh, for that, I just pulled uh, two scriptures here. Uh, is Zechariah 7, uh, verses 9 through 11. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, and show mercy and compassions every man to his brother. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. But they refused to listen or hearken and pulled away the shoulder. I don't listen to that. And stopped their ears that they should not hear. We're warned about that coming in with the end times as they are approaching. Um, closer than we've ever been before. Matthew uh, 24 tells us, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. And he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Right? Now, this has to do with those, those core principles, love and mercy and judgment, right? Um, and not the tithing of a niece and cumin, you know, as Christ tried to explain. Sometimes, uh, you know, we strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. We've got to be careful. Remember how we are looking at others, how we're judging them how we're interacting with them in our hearts. And if your heart condemn you, you know, he is much greater than our hearts. It when you don't. So let's always be introspective in how we um, act to one another and remember love and the mercy that we were given. Workers ahead, all right? Caution, men working Hazardous area. Sometimes it is hazardous preaching the gospel as uh, Paul and uh, the other apostles uh, found out, right? First Corinthians 3, um, 9 through 17. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given to me as a wise master builder, I have a foundation and another's building thereon. But let every man take heed how he's building thereon. For no other foundation can a man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. It will be shown. For the, the day shall declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide where which he has built thereon, he will receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he'll suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Don't you know that you're the temple of God and the Spirit of God is dwelling in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Right? Let me continue. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seems to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it's written, he takes the wise in their own craftiness, and again, the Lord is knowing the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God's. Sometimes those workers, uh, you know, come with a warning. They're, they're flagmen, they're watchmen. Right. Uh, Ezekiel 3. Son of man, I made you a watchman to the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die and you give him not the warning nor speak to warn the wicked from his way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I'll require at your hand. Yet if you warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your very soul. So lots of times, we know what the word of the Lord says. I mean, the wages of sin is death, right? We know these things, and when we see people do them, this is a word to us, right? To not 
passively agree with them. Right? Sometimes we need to speak out. Right? Uh, the big battle for abortion that's going on right now. Right? Life is belongs to him. Right? And nobody else should be able to take him off the throne and make that decision. Right? He says that life is precious. We need to be able to warn people, right? And not warn with haughtiness, but with the, I mean, with the sure word of the Lord, with the, uh, and being, uh, you know, concern and love in our hearts. But I mean, it's okay to be disgusted or angry with the wicked. God's angry with the wicked as well. But that doesn't mean that you don't have an underlying care for them. He wants them to be saved too, if they would turn, right? And that should be our focus as well. Uh, so I have on the screen Acts 20, uh, verses uh, 26 through 31. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Paul talking, right? For I have not shunned to declare to you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone day and night with tears. There's a flag there warning, telling us, be careful, this is coming. Right? If you listen to the watchman, listen to the flagger, you can proceed um, for his glory and in safety. Merge, merging, that can slow you down sometimes. I personally uh, always wonder about the engineering of the, uh, when you come to a toll booth and everyone spreads out and then they collide back in. I always thought it would be safer just to keep everyone in one lane, in their lanes. That's it, straight ahead. And uh, then it wouldn't have that extra human factor of trying to merge in. But I digress. We're talking about the, the, the Bible and uh, where it wants us to merge and so forth. First Corinthians 6, 17 through 20 says, But he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Flee from fornication. Every sin that a man is doing is outside the body, but he that's committing fornication is sinning against his own body. What? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. You've merged with him. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Don't merge over there. Merge with him. Okay. And Romans 8, 9 and 10. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. So remember that when you keep thinking that, oh, I'm only human, right? That's flesh, right? But it says that you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if you have the spirit of God dwelling in you. And if you don't have the spirit of God dwelling in you, then you're not his. But if Christ is in you, your body's dead because of sin, and the spirit uh, is life because of righteousness. You're going to walk in that righteousness. And I would say, if you find that you don't have the spirit of Christ, then repent and draw near to him, and he'll draw near to you. Share the road. Share the road. Usually you'll see that like with cars and bicycles or something like that. And, uh, of course, uh, when I see, see that share that road, I think of, you know, the Romans road to salvation or, um, you know, the gospel. And uh, for the record, Mark 16, 15 through 16 says, he said to them, go to you to all the world and preach the gospel to all of creation, every creature. He that is believing and is baptized will be saved. But he that believe in not shall be damned because they're already damned. If you believe and you're baptized, now you're saved, right? But he's not damning them. They're already damned if they don't believe, right? And your belief is manifest in your obedience, right? It's fidelity. You're, um, it's like being in a marriage. You, if you have, uh, if you are um, monogamous and you are um, given to just one love, then you, you know, are, you're safe, right? And if you're unfaithful to that spouse, then you're condemned in that way. I like the analogies that uh, the scripture uses a lot um, around um, 
you know, how we walk in our marriages. So sharing the road, uh, I mentioned the Romans road. Here's part of it. Romans 10, 14 through 15. How then shall they call on him whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him who they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it's written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. The gospel is a warning. And some you say by fear, but some by and some by compassion. But it's preaching peace. The enmity that is between us and God, God is our sin, and it's taken away in Christ Jesus. And that is good tidings of good things to share. And Matt 22, 9 says, Go you therefore into the highways, and as many you'll find, bid them to the marriage. Haven't you been given something to share? I think you have. We'll uh, wrap up in a couple slides here. i got a couple more signposts for us. The exit sign. No matter how long our road trip takes, there eventually comes a sign that we've been waiting for to exit. We feel relief that our journey's over. We've reached our planned destination, and now we can enjoy the times of relaxation and refreshment. And one day, your earthly journey will be over, and God will call you to exit this life, and you have to give up the ghost, so to speak. For believers, this is not a dreadful thing, but actually a relief. Our long time away is over, and he calls us home. James 4, 14 tells us, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It's a vapor and it appears for a little time and then it vanishes away. Right? Now, Peter, writing in 2 Peter, says, I think it's me, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. No, shortly I must put off this, my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed unto me. And Paul wrote similarly, in 2 Timothy 4, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure, my exit, is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And may we all be able to say the same thing as we approach that exit. And remember always that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Psalm 116.15 I do enjoy newly constructed roads, right? They're smooth. There's no, there's no problems, no potholes. The paving's clean. The lane markers are distinct, really stand out. Uh, but I don't like the process of road construction, right? It seems like it takes forever to bulldoze the roadbed, lay the gravel, pave the road. I mean, there's a lot to it, don't get me wrong. And it's very costly, actually. There's clouds of dust, ruts, lane changes that slow my drive time. So... I, you probably, I mean, I don't know anybody who really enjoys that that feature, but God is at work in our lives, and that process sometimes can be messy and slow. We are under construction for most of our lives, and it seems that it'll take forever. And we have to ask, will I ever be the person that God has in mind for me to be? Matthew 24, 30 through 31 says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, as they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he'll send his angels with a sound of a great trumpet, and they will gather together you, his elect, from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. That's something to look forward to. Philippians 1.6 tells us to be confident, being confident in this very thing, that he that began a very good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's not finished with you. And then Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God that is working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. If we submit to the Spirit, he will lead us in the paths of righteousness. Take us down beside that, that you know, still waters in the, in the green meadow. And 1 Peter 1, 3-9 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's our hope. He gave us a, the proof of it, and we can see that and hold on to it. 
to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that is fading out away, reserved in heaven for you, right? Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that is perishing, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, in whom though you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. And that's what we all look forward to. Many are traveling down that broad highway to destruction, living reckless lifestyles, right? And there, there's certain destruction awaiting them. Will you be a warning sign? Will you warn them? Your direction and your obedience, not your intentions, will get you where you want to go. God gives us the instructions to live by. You would never, you know, buy and try and uh, operate an automobile or a, a large uh, house appliance without following the manufacturer's guide to how it should operate. However, some often follow public opinion or human reasoning before God's truth. Yes, even in his church, there are people who are divided, double-minded, and not focused on pleading that one master of the Lord, having that one master. If God is not the author of how we live, then you're going to write your own laws, and there's going to be grave consequences to that. It's a challenge to live life responsibly. Life is about, and I would say life's all about choices. It's about your choices, your way or his way, right? You can go with this or you can go with that. My way or God's way. We can ignore God's signal to our hearts and minds and spirits, and we can live by our own rules. You may be doing that. You may be in and out of that, right? But you can't serve two masters. You can only serve one. Alternately, you can choose to seek and obey the creator God who loves us and speaks to us through his word and the spirit. The choice is ours. You know, if the Bible tells me I should go in a certain direction, then I better follow that direction. Why? Because God already knows where my choices will lead me. He already knows what's going to happen next in my life. His word tells me what to stay away from. And what to get involved with, right? Can you imagine traveling down the road, paying no attention to the information and directional signs on the road? But that's how many people travel God's highway, spiritually speaking. The Bible is God's direction book. God's map for our lives. A fully detailed map that includes road signs. The more we understand it, the more we follow it the more our lives are pleasing to him. And if you don't want to follow it, well, here's your sign. Thanks for listening. I hope there was some edification. Remember this next time you're traveling down the roads and, and seeing signs and apply them spiritually to yourself. And uh, I'll see you next time back over to Kevin. And God bless all those who keep his commandments and have the faith of Jesus Christ. To him be the glory. Mr. Kevin. Amen. Thank you, Ken. I guess that's why I'm not here. There we are. Pardon me? Oh, okay. Hold on. We got a crazy work for we uh, finish up here. Update on uh, Mr. Kevin Pettigrew. So it was touch and go after his surgery. There was some. But on Tuesday, he went back home. So he's all good. I actually have not heard an update since then, but um, I'm sure something serious has happened and I would have heard that. So I've been doing well. I have my father died in the hands of the physicians and all the other people and lifted our brother up. So now he's on the mend. So 
So he got his next fix. Now he's got a lower back fix. He's going to be doing gymnastics like that. So praise God. <laughs> I know we just did a trip too, so I mean, you know, it's a great way to kind of like think about the roadside. You know, it's like the best and that's why we're doing it. Thank you for bringing that up. All right, now, so we'll finish with one more song here uh, on page 199, Standing on the Promises. And I said, always do. And I said, always do. I always sometimes do. I cover it off. 